How many of you are still waiting for Mike to show up? <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, I'm Mike. That's the hardest part of this session. So if you can digest that, the rest is going to be pretty easy, okay? Um, it's kind of a, a conversation piece. If you want to know more about why I have the name Mike, you have to buy me a beer later. All right, so uh, I want to talk to you about uh, fatigue. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to try and build on the previous conversation that we just uh, um, had with, uh, with Logan and uh, the whole concept of impairment. But I want to jump right into some interesting stuff because uh, we don't have a lot of time. So the very first thing I want to talk about is the types of fatigue that we actually have. There are two types of fatigue that we have to face. One is called task-related fatigue. And that generally is, you know, you put in a hard day's work, uh, or maybe you're a manager or a supervisor and you've had to make complex decisions all day, at the end of the day you could be worn out. Now a lot of times what we try to do is we try to manage these exertions throughout the day through things like proper ergonomic design of work activities, right? Scheduling breaks and things like that. The intent is that at the end of the day you go home and eventually you go to bed, you go to sleep, and then you wake up the next day fully recovered and ready to go again. When you don't wake up the next day fully recovered and ready to go again. Now you're suffering from sleep-related fatigue. All right, do you have a fatigue problem? And here I'm talking about organizationally. Let's talk about some of the causes of it. First off, work schedule. All right, uh, we're gonna talk a lot about the work schedule designs and how that can impact our fatigue levels. Um, the other ones, uh, workload, work environment, psychosocial factors and personal factors, we don't have time to go through all of those. Here's what we know. This is what the science tells us very firmly, and this is what is now being pushed into regulations. Uh, recovery cannot occur if we work beyond 12 hours in a 24-hour period. In other words, we have to allot a significant amount of time off for people to get the amount of sleep they require, but we also have to recognize that there's more than sleep that's involved. They have to commute to and from work, there's activities of daily living that they have to uh, um, take care of, like showering, uh, eating, socializing with their family, maybe exercising. So to give uh, an employee eight hours off of work, well, that's not enough time to fit all that in, right? So 12 hours is kind of the standard that we use. If we work beyond 60 hours in a seven-day period, we're going to see the same physiological problems. The body just cannot recuperate when we start putting in those excessive hours, and it has an impact on productivity as well. So it's not a good scenario uh, in either situation. So timing is everything. This is the most important uh, factor when it comes to work schedule design. When are the employees working? If an employee is working straight during daytime hours, no problem. You can put in a 12-hour shift. You'll have plenty of time to rest, recuperate, recover. Shouldn't be a problem. If you work night shifts, ideally, and this is purely from a physiological perspective, we wouldn't want you working more than 10 hours and having the appropriate amount of time off. Now, just because that's what's going on physiologically, that doesn't mean it matches what we need in our 24-7 society. So what that means is, if we're gonna be working 12-hour shifts that carry through the night, then we have to understand the risk level is going to be up so much more significantly and we need to do something to mitigate that risk. Right? And if you have schedules that start before 6 a.m., anybody have schedules that start before 6 a.m.? Okay, so here's the thing. A lot of people think that if we have them start at 5 a.m. or earlier, no big deal. They just have to back up their sleep, right? They just go to bed earlier. Well, unfortunately, our body isn't designed to just go to bed earlier. We actually have a wake maintenance zone, which means it's very difficult for the majority of us to ever fall asleep between 8 and 10 at night. So if we're making them come in at 5 a.m. or earlier, well, they've got to get up at what, 4 a.m. to get there? Okay, so now we're waking them up in the heart of when they should be asleep, their best optimal time for getting sleep. And they can't just go to bed earlier because their body won't fall asleep, so they're actually compressing their sleep. So it's a double whammy, okay? Again, it's not to say you can't work these shifts, you can, but understand the risk attached to them, and let's see how we can have some discussions about mitigating the risk associated with these activities now, especially, especially if they're safety-sensitive jobs. So, in terms of duty time thresholds, if we work more than seven consecutive mixed shifts, so that means day, afternoon, evening, doesn't matter, seven shifts in a row, uh, you're gonna be seeing some significant risk. If you work more than three consecutive night shifts or if you work five consecutive early shifts, that's when risk will start to really uh, raise its ugly head, okay? So these are the general guidelines 
that are coming out of the signs and that are being pushed towards regulations. And I know right now that the commercial vehicle um, uh, laws are really being uh, evaluated at this point and I've been asked to confer on some of this stuff and I've been working with uh, other industries in a similar capacity looking at how do we bring these into the regulations. I want to ask a general question. Let's say you're a supervisor and you have an employee that you see on break and he's sitting there, he's rubbing his eyes, he's moving really slow, he's yawning, and you know he has four more hours left on shift in a safety sensitive position. And you walk up to him and you say, hey, how you doing? And he goes, oh, I'm okay, I'm just a little tired. What do you do? Do any of you have any policies or procedures in place in how to handle that individual? Because guess what? Those people are showing up at your work site all the time. And you need to start thinking about how are we going to address this issue? So, let's talk about this. There was a lot of commentary in the last uh, uh, session about fit for duty. Well, I want to expand this notion of fit for duty because fit for duty is not just about peeing in a cup. It's not just about drug and alcohol impairment. It's about fatigue impairment. It's about impairment <coughs> excuse me, of our physical health or our mental health. All of these represent the four pillars of fit for duty and they support performance. But here's the thing. If you have a decrement in any one of these, if I don't get enough sleep, I may be turning to drugs and alcohol to help me get to sleep. Or if I'm uh, dealing with a mental health issue, uh, I may not be able to get the sleep that I require. Or maybe I'm, I have a musculoskeletal disorder, I've got a back injury, and I'm taking medications. Well, and that's impacting my impairment at work, or it's impacting my sleep. So every one of these feed off of each other. You can't manage one and expect that you've taken care of the impairment issue. You have to manage all of them. All right, so if you have policies and procedures in place for drugs and alcohol, you need them in place for all of these as well. So that will impact your performance. So there's three approaches to managing fatigue. The first approach is when we rely predominantly on prescriptive rules, right? The hours of service regulations, that type of thing. These have been around for a long time. Unfortunately, um, there are some downsides to it. In fact, they're not in line with fatigue science, which is why so many of the regulatory agencies are now looking at updating their hours of service regulations. Um, we know that fatigue is simply too complex to solve with just a bunch of rules. In fact, there is no rule that will cover for all contingencies within an organization. And every organization has its own unique operational um, uh, properties to it. So, prescriptive rules are not the answer. Are they necessary? Absolutely. We need, we need a baseline. We need to make sure that we're not crossing certain thresholds. But what is understood now is that prescriptive rules alone are not the answer. We need to support the prescriptive rules by having a fatigue risk management system in place. This is the strategic approach. Now, this is different from a fatigue management program. I'll talk about that in a minute. A strategic approach this is the supportive framework that is going to be the foundation for all of your tactical approaches to managing fatigue. So it's how are we going to manage the situation? And the focus is on long-term success. It's called the continuous improvement approach. The management system is going to clearly identify the purpose of your program, how it's going to be run, who's going to be in control of it, how are we going to measure success, how are we going to make, uh, uh, make sure that it remains viable. And it's going to look for flaws in the system. In other words, we're not stopping at human error. We're going to dig a little deeper and find out, are there flaws in our system that are creating some of these, these issues we're facing? This approach is really good for any organization that's a larger organization or where there are safety-sensitive positions. Okay, So this is the direction that um, even the regulatory bodies are acknowledging now, rules are not enough. So, you may even have a situation where you're operating outside of the rules. They're going to say, in a lot of cases, it's okay to operate outside of the rules if you have a fatigue risk management system in place to manage that situation, okay? So, the FRMS structure, we're going to go through this really quickly because I don't want to stand between you and lunch. Um, so, there's basically five elements. What I'm showing you right now is the exact same thing as a safety management system. And most of your organizations already have a safety management system in place. So I'm not saying you have to create a whole brand new fatigue risk management system. Just build on what you already have within your safety management system. 
I want you to look at all of your management of, of safety hazards out there and look at it through a fatigue lens, okay? So here's some of the ways you can do that. At the organizational commitment level, which of course we can't do anything without organizational commitment and engagement, here are some questions to consider. Have roles and responsibilities been defined for all stakeholders regarding the management of fatigue? Were workers involved in the most recent shift schedule selection? In some cases, that's excellent. In some cases, it's not excellent if you haven't educated them first about the consequences of uh, not getting enough sleep. Strategically, some questions to consider. Is the organization aware and in sync with current uh, regulations, standards, or industry recommended practices? Okay, a lot has changed in the last 10 years. And do your scheduling practices explicitly address fatigue issues based on information from scientifically valid sources? Don't rely on your hours of, of service uh, rules to uh, provide you with good science at this point. Your implementation plan. Does your organization accommodate for rest and recovery? In other words, do you allow napping? <laughs> Is napping one of those things that's still hidden in the closet? It's a bad thing. Uh, when an employee falls asleep at work in the middle of the night, it's not because they're lazy. It's not because they don't care about their job. It's because it's biologically driven in them. And maybe your schedule design isn't helping the situation. Have employees been trained in uh, fatigue-related hazards and controls? And does the organization ensure Oops, I'm missing some of my slide. Does the organization ensure the selection of suitable lodgings and accommodations? From an evaluation and corrective action uh, purpose, is there a process in place to monitor the number of incidents or near misses where fatigue may have been a contributing factor? Here's the thing. Fatigue in and of itself is a hazard. But more importantly, it affects hazards that you've already identified out there. So every hazard you already know that exists in your workplace, Imagine the risk level, how it's affected if you add fatigue to the equation, okay? Have procedures been developed for supervisors? Ah, oh, this is a key one. Supervisors need strategies uh, to deal with employees who report fatigue or demonstrate fatigue impairment in a just manner, not a blame manner. And continuous improvement, here we're talking about is there a process in place to evaluate things like the potential exposure and risk level of worker fatigue in terms of their ability to uh, work in, under normal conditions or, or uh, exceptional conditions. The potential severity of harm related to work, work operations, liabilities, uh, community at large, and the cost of inaction. What is the cost of inaction if we don't handle this problem in terms of worker, work operations, liabilities, and the community at large? What happens if you let that tired worker drive home? Did they just put in overtime? Did they just come off a night shift? And you know they're tired and you're letting them go home? There is liability attached to that. So the tactical approach, this is your actual program, how you're actually doing things out at the work site. So the tactical is where we're looking at usually short-term initiatives. They're not necessarily driven by continuous improvement. Um, and these are best when we capitalize on best practices that are already established in our industry. This approach is often used in lieu of having a fatigue risk management system. Um, we only recommend it for smaller companies or where there are no safety sensitive or, or limited safety sensitive jobs. You, otherwise, you should have that management system to support all of your tactical efforts. So tactical efforts, let's talk about some of those. And that leads into if you finally have a fatigue-related incident, well, what is your incident investigation procedure? Are you asking the right questions in your incident investigation procedure to A, determine was the employee fatigued at the time the event occurred, B, did that fatigue contribute to the event, okay? So there's a lot of work that can be done on the organizational side to manage this fatigue problem. It comes down to this. Fatigue management is a shared responsibility. On the organizational side, we're responsible for understanding the impact of our work schedules, our workloads, and our work environment. But on the personal side of things, it's that fit for duty component, right? We need employees to make sure that if they're given the opportunity to get the amount of sleep they require to show up fit for duty, that they should take it. That may mean they may have to adjust their lifestyle, because by the way, shift work is not about a schedule. Shift work is a lifestyle. And health and medical disorders that they may have that they're going to have to uh, manage correctly. So in the end, 
Where do you want your organization to go? How do you want to manage fatigue? You may want to start with a committee. You may want to start with just evaluating what you currently have in place uh, in terms of safety management and start plugging in some fatigue elements. But that's a discussion that you need to have. All of us think we're experts on fatigue because we're always tired, right? But there's a big difference between someone who sits in an office who's tired and thinks they can put in 16 hours and somebody who's operating equipment or in a safety-sensitive job.